so essentially in this presentation, I'm just gonna walk you through some, some papers. This is, as Suzanne talk was a great uh, introduction because she walked us through a number of uh, studies that she has been involved in terms of these data integration issues. Um, and the community is still learning, both at the technical level and also based on the studies. So, um, so essentially, you know, borrowing Allah's slide, uh, it depends, I mean, there has been quite a lot of work um, of people trying to integrate this type of data, and I'm gonna show you a number of papers, a number of examples that uh, Shuzao showed were between um, the transcriptome and the metabolome, and this of course is of interest, but if you look at the, 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 the literature, in terms of sort of data integration studies, there has been much, much more work around um, these layers in, in this particular um, study. And, and there are some good reasons for that. In this particular case, you have much deeper coverage, and also you can bring, as we're gonna see in one paper, some biophysics, and therefore this goes with a much stronger base modeling of integrating data. Uh, as we have seen sort of an emerging theme uh, you know, this afternoon is that pathways is a nice and powerful way of sort of uh, summarizing data that can give you this system's perspective, you, and then subsequently when coupled with network analysis, you know, try to, to provide you uh, biological insights. Um, it's a very active research field. I mean, these are some very selective publications, you know, from some high profile journals that made the case for data integration. But you know, by now there are there is a whole pipeline of papers, many of them more technical, others that essentially show the results of this type of data integration. Uh, and just for fun, I mean, I don't know many of you have uh, used Cytoscape, you know, to visualize your data. But actually, there is a whole subsection of the plugin store that uh, essentially you can download applications that do data integration. Of course, at this point. Uh, you know, we're talking about really complicated things, so you better be very well aware of exactly what every tool or every application is trying to do before you start uh, using it. Um, Suzhou just mentioned and, uh, uh, this paper. This was a nice uh, uh, paper that talked about uh, data integration. Essentially, Mike Snyder took himself, throw about a hundred, one million dollars to various technologies and analysis, and then you know, found a number of things, and Shuzo just showed us uh, some of the data. Um, his plugin was about personalized sort of profiling, uh, but you know, from a technical perspective, I think there are a whole bunch of technical issues that are not well addressed, so take this paper, at least from my perspective as a very technical person, take this paper and the conclusion with a grain of salt, no matter what ways that you have. So uh, this is another study, a cohort-based study. So right now we start getting uh, much higher numbers. This is from a group at Michigan, Arul Chinayan and Alex Mizliski. And in this particular case, the type of data sets that they were looking at were transcriptomic data, proteomic data, and orthoproteomic data. And if you look at, uh, um, and uh, the disease under investigation was lung cancer, and essentially we are gonna start seeing some themes that uh, we saw in previous talks, and they are start emerging of how all these statistical analysis techniques start coming together. So obviously at some point there is a differential analysis because you're trying essentially to identify um, differential genes between uh, various conditions, and this is sort of a theme that the other theme that has permeated all these discussions in the afternoon. Up to a certain point, you go downstream, staying within the particular molecular compartment. And you do all sorts of analysis and modeling, and um, in order sort of to figure out what is sort of differential. And at some point, when you're trying sort of to get the bigger picture, that's when you need to start thinking, okay, how am I gonna bring these things together? Something that the community learned, and many of you, may have very similar experience, and this is emphasized in the paper. If at this point you stop somewhere, or at this point you were trying to do the integration further up, you see that there is very little correlation between these molecular compartments. That was sort of some 
of the initial ideas 10, 15 years ago, and they didn't work. So that's why for a while the community stopped trying to do data integration and try sort of to go uh, more vertical. But eventually what we start finding out is that, you know, once you have um, figured out and filter out the, the lists within the molecular compartments, then you need to start, start thinking about integration. So the way they do integration in this particular case is they define a, a score, so essentially they're looking for proteins uh, and proteins express to particular genes. So essentially what they are trying to do is, is kind of a concordance analysis, but a more sophisticated type of concordance analysis. You're trying essentially to get what is differential here and whether you have additional evidence pointing to the same direction and you keep filtering. At the end of this, uh, um, at, the end of, at the end of this step, uh, they have a number of uh, genes and then when they start sort of combining with evidence from the other compartments, doing an integrated type of uh, score and then checking for its uh, statistical significance, essentially they further filter down the list of um, enriched proteins and then they put them together in network analysis that was sort of the other thing that emerged from Jason Chazal's uh, talk. Um, this is another paper. This is interesting because, uh, again, it has a flavor. TCGA was a discovery cohort, and then you're trying to uh, validate it through another independent cohort. Uh, so this looks at uh, ovarian cancer. So here is sort of the strategy. A lot of the techniques that we discussed before the break, uh, the break come into play. So, <clears throat> so the first step here was that uh, we need sort of to, before we're able um, to proceed, we need to come up with groups. So in order to come up with uh, groups, essentially they just applied um, cluster analysis uh, on the gene expression data. So in this particular case, they had a lot of other data. They had uh, copy number alternations and mic uh, microRNA data, uh, but you know, they just use the gene expression data just to come up with the various subtypes and they came up with these four subtypes. Once you have <coughs> defined your groups, then you can start switching to differential analysis. And in this particular case, they focus on the comparison between the mesenchymal subtype and everything else. So this essentially gave you the first filter. After this first pass, there are 3,000 significant genes. And then the next question that they asked is, given the fact that we have this data from these other molecular compartments, can we explain the, the expression levels and the difference that we see between the mesenchymal group and the other groups based on this other data? You know, essentially you can think of them. So here you start doing these regression models that we briefly mentioned before the break, and essentially you're trying essentially to identify important drivers for the difference that you see in the gene expression compartments. And this allows you essentially to start putting the sources together through this particular strategy. And if I understood correctly, Shuzhou probably used a similar strategy in one of his, of his examples. So that's another way of how you, you know, sort of you break down the data and you're trying sort of to do further filtering. <clears throat> and then once you have sort of identified, so essentially there is a first filtering step here, and then you're bringing the other data compartments to do second filtering step, and at this point you start sort of trying to put things together because from your regression model, first of all, you know that these are the most important differential genes, but at the same time you have connected them with important drivers that come from these other compartments, and then you can build this, it's not a hairball as Chuck said, but it's still a fairly complicated network map, but at this point, you have sort of organized your data based on your data sources and a fairly clean uh, strategy. So we see that this is a different type of strategy than this one. Than this one, because in this case, you're not trying sort of to associate um, the expression level. In this case, you just filter up to a certain point and then you're trying sort of to weigh the evidence that comes from the different compartments. So I would call this more of a concordance type of analysis, whereas if here you're bringing more powerful tools because here you're trying sort of to associate 
this drivers with what you see in the expression for pi. Here is another uh, paper. Um, the, the reason I like this, this particular looks at glioblastoma, but this is where biophysics starts coming into the picture. I'm not gonna get into the details, but essentially they start from a model <coughs> of, um, of how copy number uh, alterations drive transcriptional changes based on uh, the system that uh, Mike Savage developed a long time ago. So the starting point here is a proper mathematical model, of course, given the fact that this is a differential equation that you know you don't have data sort of to estimate its parameters, eventually they translate it into something much more static for which then they can start playing. But this tells you is a very interesting way of thinking about it and maybe five, 10 years from now, we need sort of to start doing similar things for metabolomics data, whether you can sort of start developing, bringing some biophysics into the picture because that gives you a very clean mechanism. Easier said than done, but uh, that's why I sort of, I thought that this was an interesting uh, type of paper. And then, you know, they use again um, network analysis. So again, we see that the theme of networks plays a big role in network uh, integration. Um, some key issues uh, in all these uh, studies. So for example, in, uh, I mean, the Snyder study, there is nothing, you know, you have a sample of one, so there's nothing interesting going on from a technical perspective. A lot of interesting things from biology, don't get me wrong. Uh, one issue that you have to consider is whether in the data integration, you're dealing with matched or non-matched samples. So for example, in the Chinayan study, essentially you had on the same set of samples, these three data sources. So essentially here you're trying to integrate these three data sources on the same set of samples. Um, in this particular case, um, you are sort of trying to, you do the discovery again on match samples, and then of course you're using independent support for validation purposes. And um, this is the case for the next study as well. Um, on the other hand, we saw an, a, a number of examples in Shuzhou's presentation where the samples were not matched. So essentially, you were trying sort of to bring information from other data sources, not on the same set of samples. So this is something important. And then of course the question is, uh, what's the biological question of interest and what you're trying to, to, to accomplish? Um, so this is another class of methods that uh, you know people in bioinformatics and biostats have um, looked at. Um, so essentially you have your data sources and these are on match samples. And in this particular case, you're not trying to do any network analysis or you don't go at all into the pathway. You start using these high level techniques like principal component analysis that as we discussed, look at variation, you know, variability patterns. And they are asking, you know, what are the key patterns that summarize the information in this data source, in this data source and in that data source, and is there something common in them? So if you're in a much more exploratory phase, uh, this is sort of one way to look into um, these are, is a good way of sort of trying to think about problems of data integration. Whereas if you have a much more specific biological um, question, <coughs> you know, in this particular question, case they were interested in what is driving the difference between the mesenchymal subtype and the other subtypes, then probably just stay with principal component analysis and variance, even if you're trying to integrate that information from, um, various data sources is not specific enough. You know, you are a bit too generic, you know, in order to find uh, particular mechanisms in that way. <clears throat> but it's something that in many cases, so actually a lot of people are pursuing similar approaches um, where they, they turn the question around. So instead of sort of looking at different data sources, you know, transcriptomic, metabolomics data and so forth, 
these become data sets across, let's say, different set of cancers. So essentially you're measuring, in this particular case, the, the match component is the same genes or the same metabolite, and then the different data sources become, uh, you know, different cancer subtypes. In that case, these are particularly powerful techniques, you know, technically essentially it's the same for technical reasons, but you're asking a different type of question because essentially you're trying to see if there are common fun cancer signatures um, across different subtypes of cancer. So, or there are subtypes of cancers that look much more similar, although, you know, at, from the physiology, they are coming from different organs. <coughs> so, if you have non match samples, uh, here is uh, um, a paper that I participate in, in um, and this provides a different type of uh, strategy. So, um, <laughs> so, let me tell you a little bit about the data sources, because essentially we had data, metabolomics data, both on breast cancer cell lines and human tumors. So at this point, you know, the data integration starts becoming somewhat different because we have data from human tumors and then from cell line type of models. And then on the human tumors, you also had gene expression data. So this is sort of the common type of integration that we discuss. And then for another cohort of patients, not on the one that, you know, you have all this detailed information, um, you also have survival time, so at least biochemical recurrence data. So right now you start throwing, you know, part of these data sets are matched because on the same specimens you have both gene expression and metabolic expression data, so this is fine, and you can use various approaches that we discussed before, but what if we want to bring information from either cell line models or animal models, and at the same time you have other cohorts out there in the literature that may contain interesting information. So how do you go about that? In some sense, you start throwing a little bit of apples and oranges together and you're trying, I don't know, make uh, something, you know, to cook something. So pathways in this particular case, again, come up, uh, become important because somehow you need to start organizing the data. So what we did was in the first uh, step, essentially we mapped uh, the various data sources to a common set of pathways and then Pathway enrichment becomes again important because you, know, you need to start selecting the important pathways. And then once you have um, scored your pathways, then essentially you are asking um, the question of how you put those things together. Given the fact that we, your pathways in this particular case come from very diverse data sources, some of them come from cell lines, some of them come from the human specimens and so forth, the only robust way that at least I know of is to go to, to ranks. You know, it doesn't make sense to start, and Jeff made that particular point in one of his slides, it doesn't make sense to say, you know, I see a p-value of 10 to the minus seven for this pathway coming from this data source and a 10 to the minus three for this pathway coming from another source. You know, although both of them are on the p-value scale, the data that led to these p-values are very different. You have different sample sizes, you have different technologies, you have different noise levels, you have different curation procedures. On the other hand, the only thing that is robust is that within, let's say, the gene expression compartment, this pathway was ranked number one. Because up to that point within the data source, you followed exactly the same steps and the data where you were using the same data. And from another data source, this pathway was number two. So the only thing that, at least in my opinion, makes sense to integrate at that point, and it's a robust way, is essentially to calculate an integrated rank score, and we use a geometric mean for various technical purposes as opposed to the arithmetic mean. And then the only last thing that you need to do, and it's a little bit of math, is how then you assess the significance of this integrated score across uh, pathways. So this is kind of a robust, and a uh, method that allows you sort of to start thinking about integration in these more diverse settings where you bring a lot of information from not only different molecular compartments on the same set of specimens, but also try to bring um, information from other potential studies or from animal or cell line models. Um, so these were some of the results. So uh, some of the pros is, 
It's a simple and generally applicable strategy, and you allow for integration of diverse data sources. Uh, at the end of the day, you are still based on concordance, because essentially what you do is, in a fancy way, you have every data source vote based on these ranks, and essentially you first map everything to pathways, and this goes back to Chuck's question whether these pathways are properly defined or properly curated, and this is sort of an important issue, but then essentially you have how much each data source contributes for a particular pathway before you put them um, together. And at the, on the other hand, you know, some of the cons is that it doesn't take into consideration potential interactions between uh, the network sources. That's exactly what the paper that started with a particular mathematical model of how CNA alterations drive transcriptomic changes brings into the picture. And this is something that, you know, essentially to a large extent permeates all the analysis. You know, so as the community keeps moving forward, some of these interactions need to be, we need to start sort of thinking of how we bring them uh, into the picture. Because that's easier said than done, but I think this is sort of an important uh, component. So at the end of the day, this is an active research area. You know, it's great that we see a lot of new studies and people developing new tools, but I'm pretty sure that even if we reconvene five years from now, we'll have more examples and a few bigger principles are gonna start emerging, but um, this is sort of the question that everybody wants to answer, but you know, there's not a universal strategy. It heavily depends which questions you're asking, what type of data you have, what other data sources you can bring in. Um, so some of the key issues is which sources are to be integrated. Definitely some su sample size considerations. Um, the issue between match and non match samples. And the other big question is how much integration uh, information you bring from curated databases, whether you have the right pathways, whether you throw irrelevant pathways into your analysis. And also um, something that came up briefly uh, in just presentation, how much information you bring from the literature and how well curated the literature is and whether you need to further curate the literature yourself before you start bringing in information. So many more questions than answers, but it's definitely a very exciting topic. Questions? showed a lot of examples of how one might go about doing it. So if, we, if, if you had data, say, from you know, plasma and, uh, somebody, and DNA from you know, B cells in the blood, how would you go about, you know, there's different ways of doing it. Um, you know, is there a pathway we can sort of start following to understand this relationship between these two things? Um, so, I know I'm, 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 asking, uh, I'm asking for a lot of people who are now uh, sort of dumbfounded because you know, a lot of these studies are, are you know, really very um, involved, computationally tough. And how does one practically go about doing this? So my short answer before the coffee break, everybody's craving coffee at this time, uh, will be definitely, um, I would always think in terms of sort of pathways, and this goes back to your point, that the pathways are not properly curated or, you know, to people uh, with my background that think from the technical perspective, once you define a pathway, you know, then I know how to use it. Whether the pathway is properly defined and is related to the biological question that you're trying to answer, that's a very important question, and I think what needs to be done is you know, this, the, the people with the subject matter expertise need to start cross-talking much more with the technical people and vice versa. Because right now, there are people, a lot of people and a lot of literature that has been developed essentially in a technical vacuum. Because, you know, technically you can think a lot about these issues, but, you know, then how you apply them to, to, to the real uh, data and studies, you know, there is still a big disconnect. And one of the reasons is that in many cases, uh, we talk past each other to some extent. But aside from that, the, I think that using pathways and network analysis that was kind of a dominant theme 
in all the last two presentations is an important way to go. Um, moving forward, if you can start bringing uh, a little bit more of how the, the different molecular compartments start interacting, this is gonna give a lot of power to, to any integration techniques because essentially we are gonna start what we call borrowing strength. And at the end of the day, let's not forget, but whatever we do here, we're looking for statistical associations. And in some cases, I think some of your questions go much deeper in terms of causality, and that's a much, much harder issue to address. Unless you really have well-defined mathematical models, that then, of course, you know that the model doesn't hold exactly. That's why I showed that example where they're trying to bring some information from biophysics because that's a much better developed system. Of course, then there are gazillion of approximations to take it to something that you can use with data, but I think that's how science progresses and that's why physics were so lucky to have very nice tight models and they could run away with it. Yes? Can twin possibly benefit directly from the study of, again, single gene disorders? Single gene disorders where you find one specific <coughs> mutation recessive or dominant, and uh, <coughs> most of the time, people look for functional explanation, and leveraging metabolomics, whatever signature that you could identify, should be, in theory at least, specific, and therefore could be integrated into this whole process and allow us to predict or, or, or build models that can predict uh, probably better causal associations uh, for more common conditions. Is that possible? Because at least from the genomic side point of view, uh, this is how you know those uh, variants have been identified. You start with rare, very rare, ultra rare conditions, and you move on to better associations for more common disorders that otherwise we wouldn't consider. Why wouldn't we able to do the same thing in this setting? Oh, in principle, you know, at the conceptual level, yeah, that's one way to proceed, but the question is, do we have the data? What do all this data, you know, how much we know? It reminds me of the butterfly flapping its wings in Mexico and, and tornadoes. Uh, you know, it's, it's, you know, you can always see, uh, you can always assume that question is, is there a direct correlation between a single gene mutation that causes uh, the most common disease? In fact, um, <laughs> which is what we were talking about, you know, so that could have an echo throughout the whole body that for some other reason, and it comes back to what Joe was saying, which is always the most difficult thing, I think, especially when you're doing like plasma. You know, if you're doing cells and you're doing like a controlled system, it's great. But, you know, what's the echo that you're seeing in the blood uh, from, from multiple sources? in response to a specific mutation. Well, without this being addressed recently by Metabolon, for example, and their studies of specific inborn errors in metabolism, yeah. and uh, depending on how close, how many nodes away you are from that particular mutation, you could see those echoes it's, in it's the background. building up these kind of databases, yeah. no doubt about it, because those are gonna help. Um, you know, it's also limited by the things that we can build back in here from, from somebody who said it, is that, you know, we have the ability to only measure a subset of things um, and accurately enough to be able to say something in terms of correlation. That's usually multiple nodes down um, in the next gene. You have to really have something. You know, you have a single gene that knocks out your pinkness. I can tell you you're going to have widespread stuff on your pinkness. I'm not going to, I'm sure it's going to tell you what gene knocks out your pinkness. So that's several nodes down. Um, but you know, you've got to start somewhere. Alice, notify us. Time for coffee. <laughs>